everybody, I'm Patty Patain. Seniors, those of us over the age of 65, are the fastest growing group of cannabis users in the United States. Now, cannabis is commonly identified as marijuana and CBD. The proven medical advantages of cannabis are many, but, and this is where the problems start, there is a lack of cannabis education specifically directed to seniors. Now, Desert Oasis Healthcare is the largest healthcare management organization in our desert region. They're responsible for the healthcare of more than 70,000 members, among them more than 32,000 seniors on Medicare. Cannabis has become a medical problem among seniors, not just here in our region, but nationwide. A cannabis research study by the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, has found cannabis-related emergency room visits among older adults are increasing due to adverse cannabis use and strongly suggests that education for older adults about cannabis use should be included in routine medical care. Currently, that needed cannabis education is lacking. Right now, there is little or no in-depth education about cannabis use from our primary care physicians. That really has to change. Cannabis is one of Mother Nature's best medicines when properly used. The Pharmacist Cannabis Coalition of California was established in 2020 to provide evidence-based education about cannabis to healthcare professionals and the general public. I am here along with Dr. Brian Hodgkins, Clinical Director at Desert Oasis Healthcare. Brian, are you considering cannabis education for your group of doctors and professional caregivers here? Well, this is a great question, and and we actually have a a fantastic opportunity today to actually educate both our seniors and our doctors. Uh, We share the same experience that we've seen in not only California, but also recent publication about the Canadian experience that they've seen a five-fold increase in in, in cannabis-related, I'll just say, for lack of a better term, overdose, but really what it is 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 people not experienced or having the education or, or interest um, to have a, a, a consultation with a physician or their pharmacist about uh, a product that we know that has many medicinal uses. And so we actually have just to, tonight uh, an astute guest, of, uh, a panel of experts. We have Dr. Paul Lofholm, a consultant in long-term care uh, and in endoscopy centers, a professor of clinical pharmacy at the University of California, San Francisco. We have Leah Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a cannabis clinician from the Bay Area. And we have uh, Dr. Cody Peterson is a pediatric pharmacist and a cannabis uh, science expert from Southern California. And they really are the who's who in this state as far as cannabis, not just education, but also consultancy and how to properly use uh these medicinal um, agents. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thanks. So, the very first question I'd like to ask is, uh, you guys are the experts, and, and, and I, I'll just throw this one out to the room. Uh, you know, as Patty said, we have 32,000 seniors. We are seeing our own increase in ER visits, patients uh, presenting with an altered level of consciousness, and, and they're not sharing with the ER physician that they've even experienced or experimenting with maybe cannabis or gummies. And so not until the talk screen comes out is 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 that really discovered, and then they, they can have an open conversation. Um, first of all, let's just start with this. What are the medical uses for cannabis today, either in the senior or just general population? So the issue is, uh, first of all, appetite, uh, effects on appetite, was originally introduced for the HIV community uh, when people were undernourished and the drug was used for that purpose. Second of all, for use of pain. Uh, Third of all, use for seizures. Uh, Fourth, uh, there's some indication for uh, glaucoma treatment and lowering interocular pressure. And uh, fifthly, some uh, recent evidence in terms of treatment of multiple sclerosis. Yeah, so, I might add sleep in there. It might be another really common reason people are reaching for the Correct. The plant. Thanks, sir. Um, but it gets complicated when you ask, you know, what, what's, what are, what's approved? Because that, that's actually not the case, right? So you have botanical cannabis, the flower of the cannabis plant that produces molecules like THC and CBD. And then you've got... Um, prescription cannabinoids, so that includes dronabinol, otherwise known as Marinol, as Paul referenced. There's also a CBD product on the market made from cannabis plants um, that is be- being used to treat seizures. So there are prescription agents, but I think really what we're talking about here is 
um, not prescription use, but but sort of that medical recommendation dispensary model. Another thing that we've also seen for elderly is also um, a lot of times it's used. Um, sometimes it's used actually off label in long term care for uh, people that are hospice who are um, having pain and are having failure to thrive to help them with their appetite stimulation. Um, and we've also seen it um, for cancer patients for appetite stimulation, which is what Marinol was originally approved for. Well, for, for the sake of our audience, for our seniors, and maybe for from for some of our doctors who may be uh, tuning in a little bit later, uh, can you explain really the pharmacology? I mean, I, I, even I don't know the difference between THC and CBD, and and Patty, aren't there a few others? CB. Well, CB, CBG, and CBN are coming along. I I found a uh, a vapor pen that has THC forty nine percent, CBG, and CBN. And uh, I looked them both up, and they're both very good additives. Uh, they don't take away, they add. What do you think, Doc? I would love to jump in on this one. I just, I love the cannabinoids. I love the profile and how they come out. So actually, CBG or CBGA, which is actually in the plant, is the precursor to most of the other cannabinoids. So when CBG is decarb decarboxylated, meaning that it has been heated, the acid is removed. And uh, that is CBG, and that's what we see in a lot of products. Um, in the plant, when CBGA um, is actually uh, synthesized, is uh, metabolized in the plant, it turns into um, CB, it turns into THC, it turns into CBD and other cannabinoids. So when you say that you see CBN and CBG and all these other ones, they're actually not additives. They're actually cannabinoids that are in the plant because the plant has over 200 um, different cannabinoids that have actually been researched at this point, along with over um, 20 terpenes, which is the flavor and smell components, as well as polyphenols. So the cannabinoids, there are many and they have each have can have different benefits, but they work synergistically really well. So really, you the products with the most cannabinoids together usually have a better effect. Um, just for um, just for the overall benefit as isolates sometimes take longer and need a higher dose to be effective. So um, so they are different in many different ways. They do have different properties, but they all derive originally from the CBGA. And Cody, do you want to take it? Because I know you've got a lot on the pharmacology. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 would, I don't mind. I, you know, I don't want to get too into the weeds. This is important is, is that cannabinoids are produced in the cannabis plant. Yes, we talked about CBGA. Pretty hard to find a product on the market today containing something like that. But in mature cannabis markets, um, like we were discussing here, you might be able to find a CBG or CBN. Now, all these acronyms and the ABCs and the CBGs and the CBDs. So what we're talking about is cannabinoids. So bioactive molecules found within the cannabis plant. Now, they all have a different pharmacology. They work differently in the body. We know about these molecules because of THC. When researchers were studying the effects of THC, the, the cannabis plant at that time, and we're, we're testing out about 100 years ago, they were just starting to realize that it it had these medicinal effects, but didn't understand. It took us until the 1990s, 90 years of studying this plant, to figure out that inside all of us, there is a system known as the endocannabinoid system. Remember, cannabinoid we talked about from the cannabis plant. That's a phytocannabinoid, a plant cannabinoid. But our body has a natural system inside of us to regulate homeostasis or balance. This means um, regulating pain, make, regulating mood, regulating sleep, regulating body temperature, regulating immune response. This endocannabinoid sy system is within us and we used THC. THC was the key to discovering this whole system and that's the namesake of it. So we, we do have all these different cannabinoids. I, we would have to address each one pharmacologically. Um, but, but I just wanted people to understand what we're talking about, which is molecules produced in the cannabis plant that are actually able to hijack or mimic, depending on the dose, uh, what, what's happening in our body already. So that, that's pretty cool. So my mother-in-law, uh, she has trouble sleeping and has for years. Uh, she, she was weaned off of benzodiazepines and like uh, medications, and now she wants to experiment really with, with uh, cannabis for sleep. What, how does she go about learning about it? How, how would one like that, I mean, I know nothing about it, uh, how, how does a senior uh, learn about these products so that they're actually getting what they need 
in a medicinal strength that they can tolerate. How, how would you guys recommend that? Let's start with Dr. Lofholm. How about you? Well, the issue, the issue is uh, we have a problem with purity. Most drugs in our country are heavily regulated uh, through the United States Pharmacopeia and the FDA. Unfortunately, with the cannabis market, uh, they're all over the map. And as you can appreciate, if it's a natural product, it depends on the season, how much rain, how much sun, et cetera, et cetera, is made. So that becomes a problem. And so one of the things that we advocate for is standardized testing so we know what the dose is when we, in fact, ingest it or smoke it or uh, uh, on however uh, we happen to use it. So that's, that's the first issue to uh, take a look at. The question about your mother-in-law in particular is, we would generally recommend uh, start low and, and go slow, but uh, build up to the dose which is effective for you. And that is a kind of an individual basis. And you know, as a physician, that's the way you really treat people. Uh, you don't give them the highest dose that's possible uh, the first time, but you give them a dose that's reasonable, see how they respond, and from there, then can adjust uh, upwards or lower, uh, depending on the uh, effect of the drug. The, the biggest problem that, that I find in the marketplace is you cannot find a low THC cannabis product at this time. Uh, the lowest I found was 49%, and that's the one that came with CBG and CBN. And uh, the, the THC products on the market, the lowest one is 80%. When I started, oh. it was 20%. And it's hard. <laughs> finding, the, finding the low the low THC content is a problem in the marketplace today. Le Dr. Johnson, what do you... Yeah, explain that to yeah, us. Yeah, let me explain that a little bit. So you're probably talking about vapor vapes. So you can't really, so we don't recommend vapes for most patients. We don't really recommend inhalation. We recommend oral or tinctures, which is oral. The inhalation is, is, is pretty much everything is removed. So when they say 80%, that means of that product, that doesn't mean that it was 80% originally in the natural plant because it doesn't have all the properties that the flower has. It has specifically all the plant matter was removed. So that's, it's concentrated. So we don't, I don't recommend, I personally, with my patients, I don't recommend a concentrate. And to also answer your, uh, the um, doctor's question, I always recommend that patients find somebody to work with, especially if they're um, an older adult. Um, I have, uh, Paul and I have both worked with uh, long-term care for many, many years. And um, I see uh, cannabis patients uh, uh, personally one-on-one. -on -one, and I always recommend to see somebody or speak to somebody who knows about cannabis before starting because they can explain where the dose, like what type of dose to get, where to get it from, and they can check all your medical history. So I check all my patients' past medical history, current uh, medical history, uh, current medications, current ailments, before rec and labs before recommending a cannabis dose, because we really want to make sure there's no interactions, no issues for that patient to start it. Um, so I would. So first off, I would start with finding a medical cannabis uh, specialist to work with. Uh, for those that don't want to, the biggest thing is I always recommend stay away from inhalation because it's very hard to dose, especially if you're looking for certain things. So for sleep, usually I recommend a tincture um, or an edible. An edible is good because it will last longer usually than a tincture will. Um, and again, the dose really depends on the uh, patient. Um, but really, I, I start very, very low, like even five milligrams for some patients is too high. I don't so, think we answered poor, poor Joel's question. <laughs> well, oh, he had asked, he had we, asked uh, what to tell his mother-in-law. And I said that he that, that he should tell his mother-in-law to go talk, speak to a medical cannabis specialist. Well, I like that answer. Well, well yeah. let, let me just so, so, you, <laughs> so we've talked about you've kind of alluded to the fact that the, the dosage form actually does affect the pharmacology. And that, and that Definitely. there's also drug interactions that seniors need to be aware of. Most of our seniors could be on four or five different medications. And so the, the real question here is finding a cannabis expert in our community. It, this could be, uh, uh, you know, a, a desert for that type of expertise. Do, I mean, it, do you guys offer services one-on-one -on -one maybe for our patients to, to contact you? Or if not, uh, I mean, how do you recommend a particular cannabis dispensary to your patients? Do you pick one that you really rely on or do you find people that are experts? The, the, what do they call them? 
what do they call the guys? Bud, bud, bud tenders. Bud tenders. Bud tenders. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, that just doesn't sound too clinically uh, appropriate for this uh, scenario. But, <laughs> but but what would you what would you recommend? So we we've got oral tincture, probably better. Uh, what, what types of drugs should people be worried about? Is from an interaction standpoint, and and why and why? It's a really good, really good question, Brian. I mean, there is uh, a laundry list of drug interactions if you go to drugs.com, for example, and you just type it in. But it's it's a lot more nuanced than that. So um, when we're considering, uh, we're going to talk about THC and CBD separately here for a second because they do have different pharmacology. So THC is much more likely to increase additive sedative effects. So if you're taking a benzodiazepine or a, a a Z, you know, sleep medicine, that that can be something to consider. Um, it can in- decrease blood pressure. So patients who are, you know, at risk of postural hypotension, getting up and getting down, it's pretty significant. So there can be a drug action interaction there. And technically there, there once again is a sedative effect even with opioids. Although generally what we see is patients just require less opioids. So patients need to be considering that before they take their, their same dosage of their long acting medicine. So from THC, it's usually sort of that neurocognitive a- awakeness and, um, um, and sort of like navigating, whether it's walking or standing and things of that nature. Drug interactions seem to be pretty minimal on, in the case of THC, especially because most of our patients um, are, are needing relatively low doses um, to, the, to the order of 10 to 20 milligrams, probably on average. Now, flip that. Uh, now, by the way, if you're starting THC, don't start at 10 milligrams. That's the average uh, maintenance dose. Uh, CBD is a very different cookie. Now, CBD, you typically need doses exceeding that 20 milligrams, sometimes into the hundreds of milligrams per day, albeit not everyone. Now, because of that, and because of the different pharmacology of it, it is metabolized highly by CYP enzymes, which are the enzymes in our body and liver that are responsible for breaking down 60 or 70% of all drugs that go into our body. And because of that, we do know there can be clinically relevant drug interactions. And the ones I want to point out um, are any medication that has to do with like uh, blood clotting, but typically warfarin, that's the biggest concern. But there's even some concerns about... Um, Pradaxa, Dabigatran, um, and some of these other antiplatelet meds. Additionally, any anti-epileptic medicine. It's not that the, none of them can be taken together, but often you can see increases in drug levels, and those increases can be concerning. Um, I know I'm forgetting one. Oh, immunosuppressants, drugs like tacrolimus and cyclosporin that can be used for autoimmune conditions. Um, there are concerns related to increasing levels of those drugs and causing a toxicity. Those are and sort of the big, acid. the big ones, but I would love for my my colleagues to chime in. Doctor Johnson, I was just your add thoughts? Valproic acid. <laughs> oh, I'm was sorry, I was just, sorry. I said I was just going to add valproic acid, but like you said, like anti epileptic. But um, valproic acid is another one that gets raised with CBD. It, it, you know, I think yeah, Cody did a great job. It, I, 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 that's actually exactly what I would have said because there's not as many interactions as people think. People just get very worried when they go on drugs.com, and it's not true with all the interactions. It's just speculated interactions, not actual interactions. And most of the time, if you check blood levels, you can actually reduce the blood levels, uh, the actual dose levels of the other medications, such as the um, the convulsant medications or the valpure or, or the valproic acid and uh, to keep them in range. Like, for example, I had a patient on Clobazem who was starting on uh, cannabis therapy and uh, we just mo- the doctor just monitored his uh, clobazem levels to make sure it didn't increase. And if so, the doctor would have just in- decreased them. So it's really just keeping everything, all the regular medications still in line and to make sure that the regular uh, meds are checked properly. And that wraps up the first episode of our three part series on cannabis and seniors. We've only scratched the surface of this fascinating and important topic. In our next episodes, we'll dive deeper into choosing the right cannabis products, methods of consumption, and how to have productive conversations with your healthcare provider about incorporating cannabis into your treatment plan. If you found this information valuable, you won't want to miss what's coming up next. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on parts two and three of this eye-opening series. We'll be exploring real-life success stories, addressing common concerns, and providing practical advice for seniors considering medical cannabis. Until next time, take care, and we'll see you in part two.